I'm glad to be here with you this morning. It's a real treat. And I'm grateful that you have invited uh, Louise and me to come on this Sunday morning to worship with you and to share in God's Word. Um, as Leslie said, my name is Terry, and uh, I work with Canadian Baptist Ministries. Uh, my wife and I live in Toronto, and uh, don't, please don't hold that against us. Um, I wasn't wandering the halls of Jesus to the Nations because I was actually wandering your south shore uh, these last uh, uh, three days as I was visiting churches, but also as I was speaking to the Yarmouth Baptist Association. And I kind of fell in love with that area. I've never been along the South Shore, so it was really a, a special treat for me. Um, you know, there's, there's a sign out in front of your church that says West End Baptist Church, and any one of those three words may give a little bit of a context to why uh, you worship here. Maybe you worship here because it says the word church. I believe in gathering with God's people. Uh, in worship. Maybe you come here because of the word West End. Well, that's my neighborhood. It's close to my, my church. Uh, yeah, I have an affinity with that community. And there's probably still a few people that come here because of the word Baptist in that name. Uh, perhaps fewer than formerly because our identity as Baptists is perhaps maybe a wee bit less important to some people than it used to be. But nonetheless, we are part of a National Baptist family. This church is one of about 950 Baptist churches across Canada uh, that form together a national and international family called Canadian Baptists. And it's, uh, it's our belief that we, working together with local churches, can help to heal a broken world. And indeed, as uh, Louise shared, I whispered to her afterward, I'm going to steal your sermon. Uh, I, I, I like that one. Thank you, by the way, Louise. Um, uh, we believe deeply that by ministering together with local churches, we can make a difference in the world. We're seeing that different hap difference happen around the globe, uh, in India, in China, in Kenya, in Rwanda, in El Salvador, in Bolivia, and in many other countries around the world. Canadian Baptists have said, let's do mission together. Um, your church has said that. And through your financial support and your prayers for the Kennys, for the Waddells and the Carters, you said we want to have a hand in what God is doing in the world. And I'm happy to see uh, my brother and friend and former boss, David Watt, here. Because David worked with Canadian Baptist Ministries for many years. And David was part of enlisting the engagement of our churches in Atlantic Canada and helping them to become passionate about what God is doing in the world. So again, just allow me to express those words of thanks to you for everything you are doing. And I am truly grateful for, um, for your support. I don't know if you knew this, but about two weeks ago, it was International Day of Women. And about at that time, I was trying to reflect on what I wanted to share uh, when I was going to be here with you. And I, I think it might have been, uh, been because of that that I thought it would be good to share from this passage that Louise has just read. I am, I'm really grateful um, that I can do this. For over 147 years, Canadian Baptists have said we want to make a difference in the world and we want to make a difference in the lives of women. Not just women, children, adults, seniors, men, boys as well. But I think we've actually had a particular impact in God's broken world uh, in the lives of women. I was recently traveling in India and I had the opportunity to witness once again some of the incredible things that the church is doing in India to restore dignity to women, to help preserve girls, to help protect them, to give them an opportunity. There's one program that I witnessed that um, I was particularly drawn to. It's called the Eva Rose York Girls Training School uh, in the town of Tuni on the east coast of India. Here in this little school, girls, teenage girls are given a second chance. Some of them are given actually a last chance. Most of them are from the lowest caste in Indian society, the Dalits, uh, the untouchables we used to call them. Most of them have entered the workforce by the age of 11 or 12 years old. And this school is giving them an opportunity. They get a very basic education in the morning. They learn to read and write and do very basic 
uh, arithmetic. And in the afternoon, they get technical training, it's called, um, usually on a clunky old typewriter, believe it or not, or on a Singer sewing machine that still has pedals. But these girls are given an opportunity to learn something, a vocational skill that they can then use to help improve their lot and the, the lot of their families. The, these women are part of a very tragic social fabric in India that doesn't usually give girls and women any chance. Violence against women, as we often hear, is still very prevalent, tragically prevalent. Women are often denied the most basic of human rights, especially in rural areas, and in spite of the valiant efforts that are uh, undertaken by the government and by uh, social workers and community development workers. Um, female fetricide, which is the, the murder of baby girls, still happens. It's estimated that close to 500,000 infant girls are killed, often because the parents cannot face what is called dowry. When the girls get older, they have to, they're married off in arranged marriages, and the parents of the girl, of the bride, have to pay a rather hefty price. And so either fetricide has taken the lives of toddler girls, or by the time they come to the age of being married, girls take their own lives. Every 77 minutes, an Indian woman commits suicide because of the pressure and the shame of the high price of dowry. I think it's because also of some of the things that I've witnessed in India that I was drawn to this story that Louise read. It's one of those very gripping narratives in the, in the New Testament where Jesus encounters power. And he has to deal with power and need or power and vulnerability in a different type of way. Uh, Jesus encounters a situation where he is called upon to intervene. A crushing crowd gathers around him. They want a glimpse. They want a touch. Everybody wants to see Jesus and see Jesus act. So here we are once again in a crowd, and Jesus is called upon. And a man kind of pushes through the crowd, a man named Jairus. He pushes through the crowd, and he falls at Jesus' feet. The passage tells us Jairus pushes through this crowd. He is a rich man, the passage tells us. He's a man of wealth, he's successful, he's prominent, and he's a leader in his community. The passage tells us that he was the ruler of the synagogue. If he was the ruler of the synagogue, he was the big cheese in town. He was a man who was at the very pinnacle of the social ladder. And Jairus, in this stunning act of humility, kind of breaks through the crowd and he cries to Jesus for help. It says that he falls at Jesus' feet and he pleads Jesus to come and to heal his sick 12-year-old daughter. He breaks a social code of the day. Uh, my daughter is at death's door, he says to Jesus. Come and heal her, deliver her. Come and touch her and make her well. So here is this man at the pinnacle of the social order, uh, wealthy and powerful, and a man with access. He managed to get through to Jesus. He was probably accustomed to other people begging him for favors. But in this amazing act of love and tenderness and a cry of desperation, Jairus falls at Jesus' feet and he says, come heal my daughter. I'm sure he really loved his daughter and he wanted her to be well. At the time of Jesus, about 60% of the population did not reach the age of 15. Infant death, children's death, adolescent death was not uncommon. It happened. Sick children were not an unusual fact of life. But to Jairus, who perhaps, because of his means, had a different expectation, and certainly because of his love, he needed Jesus. Perhaps we could say his daughter really needed Jesus. Jesus' reputation had obviously kind of made it around the lake before Jesus could get there. And on the basis of that reputation, a whole crowd had gathered. A lot of people were around Jesus. People wanted a glimpse of this man, of this healer, maybe a word from Jesus, or in Jairus' case, the touch of Jesus. And in this crowd, there were people who desperately needed the master's help. And Jesus heads off to Jairus' house to bless, to heal his daughter. 
He heads off to Jairus' house. And suddenly he feels this jolt, like a, a power surge. His power has gone out of him. And he looks around and he wonders, who is this person who touched me? Who touched me? In Mark's Gospels, oh gosh, it's, it's quite amusing to see how Jesus addresses his disciples. You almost, if we were to put it in our language, Jesus kind of almost makes fun of them. They're like this bumbling group of followers who Jesus is always trying to correct. But this time, it's actually them that challenge Jesus with their question. How could we know who touched you? Everybody's trying to touch you. It would be impossible for us to know. Dozens of people probably had tried to touch Jesus. How could we ever know the identity of the person who touches you in this story? And that's when a woman steps forward. She knows that she's the one that's caused this big kerfuffle. She's well aware of the fact that it was her. And she says it. She says, it was me. And then she goes on to tell Jesus the whole story. I think I need to explain once again that social rules of the day are being broken. Just as Jairus begging, men don't beg, rich men never beg, social order broken, social rule broken, and now this woman, she says it was her, simply because women didn't speak to men in public at that time, especially an unclean woman as she was viewed. But she bites the bullet and she admits that it's because of her desperation that she touched Jesus. She needed to be healed of a disease that had inflicted her for 12 long years. The passage tells us, both of the synoptic gospels tell us, that it was probably, it was an uncontrollable bleeding, probably an uncontrollable menstrual flow. And it was as if all of her power was constantly flowing out of her. All of her life flowed out of her. Not unlike the way Jesus describes Jesus empathized with her and describes that he had this sense that his power had flowed out of him. All of her resources were spent in the consultation of numerous doctors. And all that did was impoverish her. It didn't heal her. And most likely, if she was spending her own money, as she says, it was because she was a widow or an outcast. She carried what we could call the contagion of unholiness. She was considered an outcast. But she was so desperate that she, she was willing to violate the social code of the day in order to be healed. She fought her way through a crowd and simply in doing that touched many people and rendered them unclean according to Jewish law. Although she was a woman with this infliction of this disease of bleeding, she was considered unclean. And because of this endless flow of blood, she was ostracized by her community. Remember all those other stories in the, path, in the Bible where someone brings a sick person to Jesus? She has to come all on her own. Nobody fought their way through the crowd for her. She was an outcast in the community. And she touches a man in public, which, as I said, was highly inappropriate. So Jesus said, who touches me? Who touched me? And she fesses up. As I was preparing this, I tried to think, why did it actually matter to Jesus who touched him? Why was that important? What difference will, would it really make? Was there was this sense of kind of uh, righteous indignation. How dare you touch me? As if, you know, a person has been touched inappropriately on a crowded bus. It wasn't that. Or was it because Jesus was concerned with the social etiquette? of the day? Well, next time, ask. Or was it because of that, as I described, this kind of power loss, this <laughs> surge of voltage, my power level dropped? How did it happen? I think Jesus wanted to know who touched him because he needed to address a bigger issue than that woman's unholiness. And that is, what was actually the ultimate cause of the miracle? In Christ's time, the streets and villages were full of healers. Faith healers, charlatans, magicians, people who performed all kinds of wonders. It was not uncommon. Crowds gathered. They wanted this sense of exhilaration 
Touch was common at that time. But Jesus, very mindful of this miracle that he has performed, felt it was important to clarify the nature of the miracle. And I believe that in doing so, he set about to perform an even greater miracle. So this nameless woman, marginalized and poor, speaks up and she says, I did it. And she went on, as I said, to tell Jesus the whole story. She, she explains everything. She explains her exclusion, her brokenness, this illness that she carries, that this poverty, this brokenness that was not only financial, but it was social. She was, as those girls in India that I described earlier, she was also a castaway, the lowest in the society. Anthropologists make a distinction between two things that we typically don't separate. Anthropologists distinguish between a disease and an illness. We usually use that term interchangeably. For anthropologists, a disease is genuinely a biomedical malfunction that afflicts the organ, an organ in our body. We get sick. Physical systems break down. Infection takes over and renders us sick or ill. But for anthropologists, an illness is different. An illness is a disvalued state of being. It's when social networks break down. When social networks are interrupted and meaning is lost, an illness is not so much physical as it is social. It happens when conditions cause a breakdown in cultural norms and values. It is, perhaps we would use the word more frequently, a stigma that a person carries. For example, leprosy. Leprosy is at that, was at that time, and actually up until quite recently, leprosy was genuinely, is genuinely a disease, biomedical, but it was also an illness, a stigma. People had a physical disorder, but in ancient Palestine, a leper was considered unclean, unfit for social intercourse, uh, excluded from the community. This woman in Mark chapter 5 genuinely has a physical disorder, but she also has this social illness. As I said, she was a castaway. The Bible, interestingly, likens sin to an illness, a breakdown in relationships. And in modern times, in our day and age, we still see this difference between a disease and an illness or the stigma. People who simply don't measure up on a social order because of some condition that they may have. Sometimes it's physical. People, for a long time, people who lived with HIV and AIDS were considered outcast, rejected by our society. Uh, I attend a little Baptist church in Toronto, and uh, the moderator of our church council, uh, Ruth Vallis, is a brilliant uh, medical specialist, uh, uh, leading professor in um, physiotherapy uh, in Toronto, and she's blind. And Ruth witnesses frequently that because of her condition, her blindness, that affects her not only physically, but she's also very mindful that there's a social stigma that she carries as a result of it. So when we had a discussion uh, about how we can improve the physical layout of our church, I made the colossal mistake. I didn't even know it was a mistake. I made the colossal mistake of referring people to people with a handicap. And Ruth quickly chastised me, and rightly so. And she reminded me that it's one thing to live with limitations. It's another to be categorized as a person with a handicap. And she told me, I bet you, you didn't know this, your little takeaway for today. She told me that the term handicap actually comes from the time when people with limitations had to beg cap in hand. And that's why that name has stuck. There was a stigma. In Mark's gospel, Jesus addresses a disease, but he also addresses an illness. He wanted to know who touched him, who he had healed, not only so that he could 
celebrate the healing of this woman, but so that he could restore her in her social context. Here is this poor woman, probably a widow, widow, definitely a woman without a name, rejected, and Jesus affirms her with these words, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. And I love the translation of Eugene Peterson in the message, and it's on the cover of your bulletin. Daughter, you took a risk of faith, and now you're healed and made whole. Live well. Be blessed. Be healed of your plague. She was delivered from her affliction. She was affirmed in her identity. Goodness, Jesus calls her my daughter. She's affirmed in her identity. And she's immediately given status in the crowd. Jesus speaks to her, a sense of inclusion. And in doing so, he is conveying the message that, his, that the contagion of holiness that he bore is far more powerful than the contagion of unholiness that she, anyone, especially a poor nameless widow, might bear. Jesus' true miracle in this story is not just healing her of a disease, but also healing her. Of an illness. Now let me ask you this little question. What do you think saw going on with Jairus during this whole time? We kind of forgot about him there, didn't we? What do you think Jairus is up to? I can just picture him standing on the sideline, just gritting his teeth, or maybe pulling out his hair. Here this very powerful leader of the community, this influential man who humbled himself and fell at Jesus' feet and begged Jesus attention. He has to watch as he himself is rejected, or put aside, at least, while Jesus attended to this misfit. Time was of the essence for Jairus. His daughter was truly ill, and at death's door, he said, and this unclean woman has distracted Jesus when he could have been tending to his poor, young, innocent daughter. But it seems to be too late. Jairus' servants come and say, don't bother having him come. It's too late. She's dead. Somehow Jesus overhears these words, and he overrides this message of doom. He, he says, don't pay attention to them. Do not be afraid. Just, just believe. Maybe with a nod of his head, to the, wid to the widow, to the woman that he has just healed. He said, have faith like her. And then, then in the finale of this story that we read, there's this beautiful shift, a lovely, lovely shift in this story from one daughter to another. From the one who has been dying for 12 long years to a daughter who has lived only 12 short years. And once again, the role of touch comes to play. Jesus, accompanied by a small contingent of his disciples, heads off to Jairus' house, and they go into, into the daughter's room. And Jesus touches her and makes her well and brings her back to life. And she, too, is restored not only to health, but to community, to the family. And Jesus addresses the family and says, give her something to eat, care for her, food and drink shared together to honor the life of this other daughter. So let me bring this together, if I can. A powerful man and a powerless woman. A man with access and a woman with limitations. A, a leader and an outcast. A man with a name and a woman with no name at all. A strong supportive community and a case of absolute exclusion. But in both cases, Jesus acknowledges that faith in him and in his transforming power is able to restore brokenness. It's able to restore people to health and wellness. It's able to reintegrate people into community and affirm them in their identity and to make them well in more ways than one. I've seen this in India and in China. I've seen it in Africa and South America. I've seen it here in Canada. That when the church stands up 
and says, we will care for people on the margins. We will do something for people living in cases of exclusion. We will seek to help bring about inner healing when people felt there was no hope. When people have been oppressed, when they have been broken, when they have been marginalized. I, I'm, I'm honored to be part of, of a Canadian Baptist tradition that actually has stood up for and sought the equality of women and helped restore dignity to women who have been abused. In one case, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, we work with a Baptist church family that cares deeply for women. And during the Civil War, the recent Civil War in the Congo, uh, rape became a weapon of war. I visited a church there where 95% of the girls and women, 13 years and, or older, had been raped. And as a result, they were excluded from their society, from their culture. But the church said, this is wrong. We must do something about this. And the church offered them psychosocial healing and counseling. The church offered them vocational training. The church gave them a means to be reestablished, reaffirmed, not only of their physical brokenness, but of their social brokenness and their emotional brokenness. And they experience healing. I think we can be very proud of the work that our predecessors have done to help bring about healing acknowledging and affirming, training and empowering people. And my question perhaps for you this morning is this. What is it that we, what is it that you as a Christian community are willing to do to help restore people who may be living somewhere on the margins? People that we might consider untouchable. People who are poor. People who are living with limitations. People who have been abused. I think we could afford to be a little bit more like Jairus, uh, willing to break, uh, break through the crowd, willing to humble ourselves, willing to ask Jesus to act on behalf of someone else. And somehow we might need to be a little bit more like Jairus as well, having to wait for that to happen. I think we could definitely do well to be a lot more like the nameless woman who broke through cultural rules and barriers and acted out of her faith in Jesus' transforming power, helping to bring about healing in a broken world. Please bow your heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we would do well to be more like Jairus and more like this woman without a name. To turn to you and ask you to touch our lives and make us well, but also, Lord, to intervene in the lives of people around us, people here in Halifax, but also people around the world who experience various forms of brokenness. And we ask that you would use us, your church, to be agents of healing. Father, we thank you for the lessons of this passage, and we pray that we would apply it in our lives, seeking out opportunities to bring people to you and experience wholeness in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you very much.